I know our group is a lot more vibrant, but now that Tejan's here, he can like actually tell the difference. So uh, he, he was helping run the iOS training. Um, but please unmute yourselves. Just kind of, I'm gonna ask you to call out things once in a while. I'm gonna ask for people to volunteer to read. So just be prepared for that. Um, and let's kind of uh, just avoid the like, I don't wanna call on you guys. Um, I really want this to be as open of a conversation as possible. So don't be shy to just share out your thoughts. iOS was quiet because we we're skipping lunch to do all this, but. <laughs> just kidding yeah well next time we'll send you guys all virtual pizzas yeah um so super tpms what does it take uh this is like i mentioned the part one of a training module so could i get a volunteer to just read what's on the screen right now okay i'll read it uh Okay, so uh, technical program managers. Technical program managers are the lifeblood to what makes Copath and Facebook courses possible. The expert in the room is a content, content plus our discussion support, a system support team. TPMs are facilitators, not professors, of students' learning experience. Your training assists in helping you craft an environment where your students have the best possible experience learning mastering and struggling with the content of the course. You are more than just content fac facilitators. You are creating the space to ensure students are thrive, feel excited, learn at a brisk pace, and build a network of peers. Thank you, beautifully read Vincent, right? I'm just guessing. Um, yeah. That is, that is uh, I, th I don't think this is new for any of you guys, but this is kind of just to remind us and put us in the right place of when we're gonna enter into the next conversation. Any questions about this or thoughts? Uh, so I had a question. The sentence where I said uh, TPMs are facilitators, not professors of students learning experience. What did you mean by that last portion? So I think, actually we're gonna, we're, we're about to talk about this, like what is maybe, what are maybe the differences, but, um, facilitator we'll just actually if this is an answer your question we can circle back but facilitator comes from the word the french word facile which means easy and the idea is that you are trying to make it easy for students to learn so the student the experience or the environment includes kind of the atmosphere the um the i guess first line of technical support you can offer creating a creating teams of students or interesting activities to make them really engage with the content and with one another. So when we talk about um, learning experience, we're not just talking about the content mastery because the content's all online. Like the students could just sit at home technically and do all the content themselves. So why are we bringing them together? That question, that kind of X factor is you guys and the fact that students can come together and learn with one another. So that learning experience goes just beyond kind of the actual learning of the content. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a really good question, by the way. No one's asked that before. So um, I'm just going to do a little spiel here. Uh, we all would like to fancy ourselves to be Professor McGonagall, where we walk into a classroom and we can command a lot of attention and everyone listens to us and it's quiet and attentive and we have a lot of respect. But I think more often we end up kind of feeling like this. <laughs> where we're kind of like, what the heck am I doing here? I'm not an expert. Or sometimes students ask you a really hard question. And you're like, oh, I got to sound smart. But actually, none of those things are true. In fact, if you don't feel this way, I'd be a little bit concerned because none of us are content experts. Most of us don't have real field experience. So when we're going in to interact with our students, we are trying to put on this, profess uh, this facilitator hat and not professor. So um, I shouldn't have put the answer in there, uh, but does, I, I actually have a question for you guys. Um, so they did a survey where they asked students uh, who did online courses who they asked for help most. Um, did they ask for help from their peers or did they ask for help from their teachers? Which do you think was the predictor for whether a student would stay in a course or not? Asking teachers for help or asking professors? Can people you just said, shout out answers? Professors. Asking for professors? Asking their peers, I guess oh. other students, or um, professors. What do you think was a bigger predictor of them staying in the co online course? 
Oh, peers. I say they're peers. peers. Yeah, students. I would say peers. Oh, I love this. All these answers. You guys are right. This is very smart. Um, yeah, so those who say that peers are the ones that they ask for help, we're much more likely to stick to the duration of the course. And that's what we want you to be. We want you to be their peers. So let's talk about this. What is the difference between a professor and a TPM? Um, I'd love to just kind of hear you guys shout out some ideas and I'll write them up here um, and save them. But let's start with professor. If you were to imagine a lot of the professors that you've worked with or that you've had, or even I guess teachers, what do you think is unique about their role? Like what is it about a professor that makes them a teacher? Did you pick out three and four? Yeah. You did? Um, if someone's, I think we're getting a little bit of background noise. If you guys have background noise, you might hear yourselves. Thank you. So what is unique about the role of professor? Can people call out some thoughts and I'll write them down? Uh, kind of being able to like explain potentially very difficult concepts in a way that's like hopefully as you know intuitive as possible to understand like be able to like go through examples and stuff and show like not just you know what something is but like how it works why it works. Mm. Okay yeah getting to the why that's really really good. Good professors I think are really well are really good at doing that. Thanks, George. What else? I got one. Uh, they're expected to know everything, or well, almost everything. Mm -hmm. Knowledge. That should not be correct, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh oh, guys, we have a professor in the room. <laughs> okay. So, um, Dr. Ibrahim, can you can you explain what you meant by that? Uh, the problem is that when we explain um, questions that are still open up until today or something that is not really, really obvious, all what we have to say or all what we can to say is what people think about um, this concept, but there, there can be things that we certainly don't have a very clear answer to. Mm -hmm. um, and we can just anticipate or, or have our own ideas without being very clear about what it is and how did it happen. So uh, what do you do? Especially in the security field. So what do you do when you have something that you can't answer yet? What do you say? Uh, I say this is what I think it is, but that doesn't mean that it, it, this is what it is for sure. Okay, beautiful. What else, guys? What else is unique about the role of a professor? Or what are some of the attributes that make an awesome professor? They construct lesson plans. Like, they're in charge of deciding which, less, which way to introduce topics. So, like, some of the best courses I've taken is when the professor had a really solid lesson plan and the topics, like, led to one another. It wasn't just, like, throwing knowledge at us. Um, I think an attribute that makes a really good professor is if they um, make the environment so comfortable that you're able to kind of go up to them and ask them any question without kind of feeling scared, I guess. Mm -mm -mm. Um, so they build a relationship with you, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's nice. I would also say that um, a professor is able to grab like real life examples into the classroom to relate it to the material. Yeah, and kind of building off of that, like between the last two points, um, like when professors kind of build like an environment in the classroom that's more interactive, I think. Mm -hmm. um, because like you're a lot more likely to learn when you're actually like interacting with others and actually participating rather than like just like passively like listening to the professor teach different topics. Oh my god, these are so good. Okay, so then let's let's switch gears a little bit. What is unique about the role of a facilitator? So if these are the things professors do, they explain concepts, they are sometimes expected to have all the answers, they're kind of seen as these experts. What do you think is unique about the role of a facilitator? I think with the facilitator, you don't necessarily need to have like a very strong, strong foundation and all the knowledge. It's more like you are working with the students to kind of 
learn from each other and work with each other to create a mutual understanding of the content mm. and kind of build on each other. Um, so what do you get then what do you guys what are you coming in with so if you're not coming in with this content expert what are some of the things that you have as a facilitator I think uh, can I think about like maybe emphasize a bit more of like the difficulty they're having it could be like okay yeah this is you know really hard material I've done it I had you know these same issues with it here's like kind of you know what I did to like figure it out and like you know you get it too mm -hmm. I think another great thing is, sorry, I think another great thing is that um, we're also students ourselves. So a good attribute is that we're able to relate better to the student um, and kind of understand maybe what difficulties they would face with the content. Yeah, I would say like a facilitator is like more open minded, like in case like, you know, like there's always different ways to solve problems so we could all share our different ideas and like and see where like uh because then i know like a lot of people do like uh because i did like some tcs before and then i see like some really really crazy ideas like they went from they spent like the whole time doing ex uh, spending their time on like, excel sheets because he's he, he likes to use excel so yeah there's like a lot of different ways to solve things so it's really cool to share and then expand mm. on that That's awesome. Any last thoughts? One thing that might uh, work eventually for both uh, sides is um, showing that they care by mm -hmm. following up on things that they uh, need to research uh, or if they don't have time and they need to get back to a student, they, they really need to do it in a, in a, a reasonable amount of time, not, a, not too long time. Yeah, I would definitely see that goes under both. Cool. So we're going to continue having these conversations. I'm so glad we have lots and lots of stuff on here. Um, let's, con let's build on these concepts. So I want all of you guys to close your eyes. <laughs> and I'd like you to picture in your mind the greatest teacher you've ever had. So this can even be like elementary school. Like I, for me, I think my favorite teacher ever was in third grade, Mrs. May. Like she was awesome so just like try to imagine the best teacher you've ever had and try to like and these are just some questions i'm going to throw out but like imagine like how they dress how they talked what kind of jokes they made what kind of relationships they had with you or their students and just like bask in that for a little bit i don't know if people are closing their eyes <laughs> no no I don't need to okay. <laughs> You do? Okay. So can like one or two people share um, who this person was, a little bit about this person? I'll go. So I, I guess it's my current professor, Dr. Martin. He's kind of everywhere and then always in one place at the same time. He very interactive with our class he jokes around like one of our projects if we don't set up our pens on our circuit boards correctly we can martinize the board or make it blow up which no one's done yet hopefully and he's just like very interactive with the class and he's very polite and he'll go out his way to help students like i remember i went to his office hours one project and i spelled xor wrong and literally he just sat there for an hour past his office hours just to make sure that I got the project right. So it's mm -hmm. like, he's probably my favorite professor so far. And he's just like very happy, happy-go-lucky type of person. That's awesome. What's his name? Uh, Dr. Martin. Dr. Martin. Anyone else? Well, we can have one more story. Uh, I, I'll go. Uh, I had a teacher in high school. Uh, I forgot her name. Sorry. <laughs> she was a really good teacher. Like she knows how to connect with students and you tell her like everything. And it, it'll be private too. She won't like go going out 
go out and tell everybody like the principle about what you do. It could be some bad things and some good things, but you tell her like basically everything, and she understands you and. Yeah, it's really good to talk to you. She's like a slash counselor slash teacher. So it's mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. I think uh, when teach sometimes teachers can play that role of like mentor. I became really good friends with one of my professors in college, and like to this day we keep in touch. And she's always sending me interesting opportunities. She like genuinely took an interest in my life. I had this one professor in college. I'll quickly share. His name was um, Professor Patel. Oh my God, the first day of class. This is, so I went to business school, I went to Wharton Business School and like it's like quite serious. And, like a lot of the professors are like really like into themselves. Um, but we had this one professor, oh my God, he was like younger and he came in the first day wearing, you know those uh, shades that people wear at like concerts all the time or like parties that have those like lines in them. Like you can't like, they're like hard to see through. I don't know, people, like some people are nodding, you know what I'm talking about. So he walks in wearing those glasses and he opens the class with a rap song that he made <laughs> about the class. And literally, I like looked around the room and everyone's just like cringing in their seats. It, it was like, it was not that it wasn't a good rap, like it was fine, but it was just like so jarring. And he shared that his passion in life has always been to be a rapper. And so, you know, he settled for professor at a business school. Um, so he wanted to combine his passion with his teaching. And I think that was what made so many people like him was that he was so genuine. And I think every single one of us have our own passions that maybe aren't necessarily always related to cybersecurity or even programming. And I think if you can bring in that like genuineness to your classroom, like you will see people opening up to you in like a very different way. Uh, He was, he was an awesome professor. All right. So breakout room time. Um, we're going to take 10 minutes and put you guys all in breakout rooms to answer a couple of these questions. Let me just, uh, I'm going to put underneath. Anisha, how many rooms are we making? So we have 18 participants, um, Mm -hmm. excluding you and me. So 16, so we can do four breakout rooms with four people each. Okay. And roughly, is it going to be people from the same universities at least together? Um, we, I can do it manually if needed. Um, yeah, I would like ideally for, or maybe this time for the sake of time, we'll just break them up. But um, I mean, this is just part one. So maybe next week we can try to put the TPMs together so they can share strategies and ideas. All right, so we're going to put you guys in breakout rooms. I'm going to share a link with you that is that shows you the documents uh, of the questions and how you can sh- uh, and where you can write your answers. Let me put it in this chat real quick. Um, so basically, there's a bunch of questions at the top. I don't need you to answer every single one of them one by one. What I would like ideally is you guys read the questions together and just start kind of brainstorming and writing down. They're just Um, here to kind of spark conversation, but just write down some of the thoughts that you guys have around what motivates you and what and how might you learn from those things to motivate others, in particular the students that you have. Um, We're going to take about 10 minutes to do this and then we'll come back and we'll do the topic overview um, with Sasha and Kestrel and then we will go into our breakout rooms to finish the rest of the labs. Okay, cool. I'm going to go ahead and open all the rooms. Bye guys! Anisha and I will drop in piece by piece, and Tejan, if you want, we can also put you in a room. Uh-huh. Awesome. Cool. You guys have all been invited. Uh, Professor Abraham, um, we are splitting off into breakout rooms, if you're good to go. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Uh, Did you get an invite to breakout room one? I didn't get. You didn't get it? Okay. Let me... Let's see. Okay, wait, now did you get an invite for breakout room one? Uh, where, where should it appear? It should appear in the Zoom. Um, 
it should be like a little um a little kind of a a little pane that comes up that says would you like to move to breakout room one oh okay yep okay. thank you okay. perfect no problem Hey, Anisha. Um, Welcome back, everybody. I think we still we're I'll wait till everyone gets back and do a quick debrief. Okay. Oh, I think everyone's back. Someone's still writing on the doc. Okay. So um those are some really interesting conversations. I read through the other answers that people had. Anisha, uh, feel free to chime in. I just want to mention some things I heard that I thought were really interesting. Um, so the reason we do debriefs and pre-briefs before every single session, it might seem like we're just trying to belabor points, but the point is when you learn something, if you don't have time to tie it all together, sometimes that learning won't stay in your mind. And so what we're doing when we're debriefing is giving us all a minute to help these concepts kind of settle in our brains, have the new neuro networks form, and for us to really try to learn some of these concepts. Now, I'm also to share what happened in the other rooms. So some of the things I heard that I really thought were interesting and read was teams talked about transitory motivation versus intrinsic. So intrinsic motivation could be like connecting it to your passion, connecting it to making the world a better place, connecting it to a future job. Um, whereas transitory things are more like grades or um, fear of punishment, um, things that kind of will correct your behavior but won't last. Uh, I also talked about people, but I also heard people talking about building motivation. Um, we talked about how sometimes you're more motivated when you come into something loving the subject. Other times that that passion is built. Um, or are cultivated by the teacher. So one of the ways is having students um, have small wins, right? Feeling like, oh, I can do this. I like this. Um, other thoughts were connecting it to real world applications, visual aids, corny jokes, um, linking the learning to long-term long future potential. Um, and most importantly, understanding that people have different learning styles and trying to accommodate those. Anisha, do you wanna add any? So mainly, I just like just kind of cycling through um, the main things that I heard was like 
kind of what makes you a good learner. I heard the peer, like peer to peer concept again, and like having that support system together. And it's kind of really cool because it ties back to kind of what we're doing here and how you guys are at all different universities, but you guys are the support system, the TPM support system. So it's awesome to see that. Great. Um, so I just want like a physical show of hands. How many of you guys played the role of facilitator in your breakout rooms? Did anyone play that role a little bit? Okay. And so there were four rooms. So we had two facilitator roles played. Uh, what happens when there isn't a facilitator? What happens to the conversations? I think it's if there's no facilitator, it's hard to steer a conversation in the right way or form direction. So it's always nice when someone takes charge or if multiple people take charge because then you can see more progress. Okay. And what do you mean by taking charge? What does that, what does that look like? Um, someone stepping up maybe to just, you know, <coughs> it, like for this example, um, we had to all answer the questions that were on the document. So maybe if someone uh, voiced, like said, st st sorry, <laughs> if someone stood up and maybe like relayed the question to the whole group and was like, okay, let's throw some ideas out or what do you guys think of this question? So someone, I guess, who's facilitating and getting the conversation flowing in the group. Okay, so th those are really good examples of tools that you guys have as facilitators. So asking questions is one. Contrary to popular belief, asking open-ended questions is actually not that good. Um, we'll talk about how to ask good questions next session. Um, and also sometimes breaking the ice by putting yourself first, putting yourself out there, sharing something about yourself or sharing your own thoughts. Great. Um, so we're going to jump into topic overview and Anisha will take over from here. Uh, I love all these ideas. Like I mentioned, we're going to consolidate these um, again, also with the iOS learning. So you'll also be able to see what other students are saying from different universities and we'll share them next week to go into facilitator training part two. That'll be next week will be our last session. The week after that, not the week after, but the meeting time after that in January will be our session kickoff. So that's when we'll come, we'll share some final kind of here are the things to look out for. We'll share the schedule for the semester. Um, we will also share with you kind of like a finalized TPM cheat sheet or uh, playbook that as Anisha calls it. Um, and so we want to give you guys everything you can to help you and your students succeed. If you have any questions, message me, email me, um, or obviously Anisha will be here also. So have a great session, everybody. And I look forward to seeing the recording later for Sasha and Castro. All right, awesome. Um, so, Sasha and Kestrel, do you want to go ahead and uh, give us a topic overview for week eight? Yeah, sure. Um, am I supposed to share my screen or? Do yeah, we... you, can, you can go ahead and share your screen, whatever um, you guys have planned. Cool. You should probably share your screen because my internet keeps cutting out, so I might lose connection. Okay, perfect. Just, yeah. I'll, when I get to the slides, you can just tell me when to go to the next one. Okay, let me just give me just a second. There we go. Okay, cool. So, do you, does anybody know how to get to just play from the slide? <laughs> or can I just go from here? I think I'll just go from here. There's a present. Top right. You can press present on top right. Top right. Okay, cool. Perfect. Can anybody, everybody still see? No. Okay, perfect. Okay, so for this lab, we're just going to be talking about um, social engineering, which is just manipulating people to get them, like it says here, to get them to perform actions or reveal personal information. Um, mostly with social engineering, there's many types, but the types that we're mostly going over this week is just um, pretexting, baiting, and phishing. Uh, pretexting is just times where you're pretending to be somebody that usually takes information anyway, like pretending to be an IT person and asking for users' IP addresses 
and just inventing scenarios and times where you can get that information pretty easily. Um, baiting is just when you're um, giving out click, like clickbait basically to uh, take advantage of what people want. So taking advantage of users greed and what they want as a person. Um, then we have uh, phishing, which is where you send, uh, you'll find like emails like the junk spam and all that kind of thing where uh, you send emails and you'll have malicious file attachments that then you, the person would then click on and you'd upload that malicious and, um, files to your own software. And then there's the cute things. Um, and then there's just cute comments, um, email accounts that said that. And then it's over to Sasha. So now that you know what social engineering is, it's time to talk about how to defend against it. So some simple defenses are don't open suspicious emails, don't dispose of information, dispose of information properly. So shred your documents, erase your hard drives, and then perform security audits. So Basically, the defenses are categorized in three different areas. You have education, which is if you have a large company, you want to have a set of guidelines and skills that you can implement in a direct path or plan that people can use to appropriately dispose of their data. And then you have information disposal. So once again, you want to have a set of plans or guidelines on how you deal with information that is not being used anymore. For instance, if you have a server that's being put in a back door or like in your backyard or thrown out, then you want to make sure that your hard drives are clean and that everything is disposed of properly and that no traces of information that could be exploited are left. And then you have testing. So you can do anything from having an outside security firm come in and pen test your system or have your own security team do pen testing itself. So can anyone think of any other social engineering defenses that they've come across or Anything like that? Yes, this, yes, no. Feel free to speak up. <laughs> that awkward pause. You got everything covered, Sasha. So I'm going to take that as a no, and we'll talk about footprinting now. So that's the next slide. So foot Printing is basically gathering information about an organization. So the information could be a list of IP addresses or usernames to what servers are active and what servers farms are active. Like a great example of footprinting happened in the first episode of Mr. Robot when they do that initial attack. Basically, the hackers, they went in and they figured out which systems were online, which systems controlled what parts of Evil Corp, and then they attacked it. And so there are different subcategories of footprinting. There's network enumeration, which is where you get a list of servers and networks. So you find out if, say, group A has 17 servers and they have them running to like 40 different networks, you find out which servers are active and then you kind of case the joint and determine, oh, if this server is active at this time, I can hack it this way and go about attacking the system in like a strategic manner. And then you have fingerprinting, which is where you're doing basically the same thing as, you, as network enumeration, but you're targeting specific targets. So for instance, if you wanted to directly attack one server farm, you would only do reconnaissance and casing of that particular farm and learning the ins and out of the operating systems, the hardware, the IP addresses that flow through there. And then basically footprinting is like the key to understanding social engineering. It's like one of the most heavily used concepts. It's basically what you do when you are a bank robber and you're trying to rob a place, you're casing the joint. And so a great example of social engineering in the works. Oh, can you flip the slide? Sorry, I forgot to say that. So a great example is recently I think the company is called, let's see, I wrote it down, NiceHash or something like that. It's one of the Bitcoin companies. They were hacked this week for $64 billion worth of Bitcoin. And basically, they're describing the attack right now as an expert level of social engineering to get into their system and to steal all that Bitcoin. So that's just a real world implementation of it.
And that's kind of all we have for you guys for social engineering. And there is a lab and an assignment for this week. You're going to build off of the WordPress and Kali Linux assignment that she did last week and then go through a few more explanations in the lab. So, yeah. That's like it. Cool. I'm like, yeah. Does anyone have any questions about social engineering? This is actually like, I think it's kind of the coolest part of security because like, um, I just had an assignment in one of my security classes and literally it was social engineering to like hack into the server. We had to figure out the password and then it just ended up being password. But like you had to like kind of just maneuver through different tricks. Also, um, uh, just a little tidbit. Um, every October, Facebook does a thing called Hacktober, or yeah, Hacktoberfest, uh, where they just try to hack into people or like try to see all the vulnerabilities within the company. So one year they actually sent out mass email to everyone saying, hey, sign up to have a lunch with Mark Zuckerberg. All you have to do is put in your like email and password and like a ton of people did it. So like, it's kind of hard to see, um, I don't know, different cases that this occurs, but when it does, it's like really bad. So <laughs> yeah, cool. Um, so do you want me to go ahead and assign breakout rooms for everyone to start with the lab? Or do you have anything else on social engineering? Sasha and Kestrel. I think we're good. Yeah, Perfect. I think we're good to go, yeah. All right, I'm going to go ahead and do the same amount of breakout rooms for everyone. Here we go. Well, I got something to say. Uh, you should read up on uh, Kevin Mignick. He's like a pro at social engineering. Cool. If you want to um, broadcast that message to everyone, that'd be pretty cool. Um, I'm just interested, like, seeing the name. <laughs> OK, I went ahead and opened all the breakout rooms. So you guys can go ahead. All right, just waiting on, there we go, cool. All right, so just kind of bringing it back together, doing a wrap up. I do know that one of the groups was trying to tackle a bonus question and um, we're wondering if anyone in this group has completed that. Do you guys wanna talk about someone from breakout room three ask more about the SQL map versus the security shepherd yeah. question. Cool. Does, does anyone know how to use SQL map? So I tried following the, um, the answer key also. And like, we're not getting stuff. We're getting errors. Uh, I did it. I just forgot what command I used. Uh, if I can access my Kali Linux, I can probably find out the exact command that I used. All right, that's cool. Okay, um, but yeah, overall, uh, just a wrap up session. Um, so does anyone have any last minute questions about week eight? Do you guys feel like you made significant progress, anything? If you do have technical questions, post on discussions.copat.com. Uh, Otherwise, feel free to kind of like reach out to you guys. Like, this is your support network right here, um, your peer to peers. So, I do know that we do have like the status update and student applications. Um, if you could go ahead and, I'm not sure. Did you guys uh, put up student applications already, or kind of what did you guys do last time during the sessions then? We good? Okay. Um, yeah, okay. I'm not sure about this, but we'll just uh, include it in the last session. So next week is the final wrap up of uh, describing course policies, go through a final survey, just kind of like how the training went. Um, and if you do have any questions in the meantime, feel free to email me or say on um, or support our code path that goes to all of us. So um, yeah. I will conclude this. Oh, Anisha, I have a question. Yes. Uh, so just to confirm, there's no pre-work for the application, right? Uh, no. The Usually the pre-work has been um, kind of integrating the first week 
off the course. Cool. All right. Thank you. No problem. Okay, cool. Have a good weekend, guys, and we'll see you next week. Enjoy your weekend. Cool. Yeah, have a good one. All right, bye, everyone. Hey. Cool. See you. Bye. Bye. -bye. Yeah, could you leave me here for a while? So maybe Miguel can help me out. Leave so, you and Miguel here? Yeah. Okay. Actually, everyone here is from CCNY. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, like, um, I'll just be on the call if you guys don't mind. Like, uh, uh, yeah, when sure. I do end it, it would, like, completely end it, so. Um, you could pass the host for this. Okay. Um, the, yeah, I can go ahead and do that. Yeah. Let's see. Chat. Uh, okay, Sunny, I'm going to make you the host. Sure. Cool. Um, cool. Okay. Thank you. Uh -huh. Let's can discuss. I'm going to go ahead and head out. Okay. All right, Miguel. Let me uh, just show you. We're still recording, guys, by the way. Bobby? We're still recording. Oh, how, how did I stop this? Uh, I don't know. You're the host now, though. All right, I'm going to press this. I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> I'm going to press stop recording. What do you think is going to happen? Uh, I don't know. There's a recording button. Maybe. Yeah, I, I see a recording. It's, there's a pause and there's a stop. I guess just stop. And All right.